So to start a project, uh, we'll launch the project and we'll kick it off uh, with some sort of hook that will really get the students engaged. And that's usually around, you know, the first step of the engineering design process is the ask inquire step. And so we will ask them a question and as part of that essential question that drives the project, we'll ask them to imagine being in the role of a real scientist, a real engineer, a, a real technician. And we'll ask them to assume that role uh, for the duration of the project. And so from that point moving forward, they're no longer a student in clean energy technology. They're a renewable energy engineer for the duration of that project. And then they'll start, in their collaborative team, they'll start to address and plan out how they're gonna solve that problem that we pose to them. And this is where one team will go down one path and another team will go down a totally different path with that solution to their problem. A lot of the projects will have um, some sort of deliverable or prototype um, that the students will develop. And so we ask them to plan that, but then we also ask them to create that. And so it's very hands-on. They're using technology. You know, they're using lots of equipment and they're coming up with this three-dimensional prototype um, that's that team's answer to the problem, right? That's their solution that they, that they came up with. And then we've got to know whether it works or not, right? Is that really the answer to the question that we gave them at the beginning of the project? And so they'll have to test it. And so they'll go through uh, several tr iterations of trials where they'll use the technology that we provide to them, the software, the hardware. They'll collect a bunch of data. Sometimes it's a competition where we'll pit teams against one another so they can have some fun with that. Um, but then they'll figure out how well their solution to the problem works, right? And so that, you know, evaluate experiment step of, of the engineering process usually takes them quite a while. And it's very cyclic. And so they'll keep reiterating that prototype. And so we give them multiple opportunities for success. You know, we pose that as, well, that's what real engineers and real scientists do. It doesn't work the first time you create something. Um, and so you gotta go back to the drawing board sometimes. You gotta modify your plan. And now you gotta come up with a second prototype or a third prototype or a 99th prototype. In the real world, that's what it takes sometimes. And so it encourages them to struggle, but it encourages them to be progressive in their struggle. So maybe they saw one little piece of it on their way to the solution. And so there's a whole bunch of improving. We would love to give them all the time in the world to do that. But because we'd like to get through all the projects in, in the AC sequence, um, we'll give them a limited amount of time to do those reiterations of their prototypes and improvements. And eventually at the end of the project, we'll ask them to communicate their results. And so um, they'll present that uh, to their classmates, to some authentic outside audiences, and so we'll invite folks in. Um, to help critique their process. We want to hear what were your thoughts when you were going through this engineering design process? Uh, what was hard for you? What did you learn through the process that maybe you didn't already know when you started out on this? Certainly in the authentic you know, project that they produced, uh, we'll evaluate them in, in their written work that they'll do at the end of the project and in, in their um, oral presentations that they communicate. And so there is a good bit of formative assessment throughout the project, but then there's also some traditional assessment to it. In the environmentally friendly fleet project, the students uh, in course two, um, they're midway through the project. Um, they've done some research, they've done some experimentation already on electric vehicles. Today we were challenging them with some really technical components of the project where they used a MyDyno device. Um, that's a dynamometer that allows them to simulate real road conditions for vehicles and do performance tests. And so the students today were charged with the responsibility of powering their MyDyno device using outlet power, using rechargeable batteries, and using hydrogen fuel cells as power sources. And the student teams had to design their own tests, and so they had to um, adjust power, they had to adjust the load on the vehicles, they had to come up and design their own tests because we didn't give them a scripted sheet, we didn't give them a step-by-step -step game plan for what they had to do in the lab. What I really hoped that the students would accomplish at the end of this task is that they would have collected some data that was meaningful to them to address the purpose for this project. And that purpose is we want the students to make a proposal for a particular company for their fleet of vehicles for the future. And so these students are addressing future problems today in our classroom. And they're getting to use technology that students don't typically get to use in a high school classroom.
So since we are right smack dab in the middle of this project, this is just to recap because I can guarantee you the activity you're gonna do today is gonna challenge you, right? And you're gonna have some difficulty with it. You're gonna struggle a little bit with your teams. This is to let you know that you've already done a bunch of the background work for the activity you're gonna do today, okay? And I bet you, you guys can come up with the answers to those questions that are up there from what you've done the past three days, right? Not Wednesday when we weren't here, but the other three days before that because you did um, a PASCO lab um, that exposed you to fuel cells for the, for the first time, traditional fuel cells. And then last time you did a surge power lab, right? So how can an electric car be powered? We talked about this on day one. What can we power an electric car with? There's really three main ways we can power it. Hydrogen, Hydrogen fuel cells, absolutely. Yep. What else? Electricity. electricity. Who said it? Nathan. What? Electricity. We can power with electricity, right? Didn't we talk about how ideally we'd love to be able to take our electric car and plug it into the wall, but why can't we do that? Power needed. Not a, not a long enough cord, right? So it's not portable power. That doesn't really work for the transportation industry, right? So we, we kind of cut the cord. We can use hydrogen fuel cells, and what's the other portable power? Diesel. Not in this class. What? Rechargeable fuel cells. All right, rechargeable fuel cells, or maybe even less technical than just fuel cells, rechargeable. Just batteries. Just batteries, right? Rechargeable batteries. So we could use rechargeable batteries that we just charge up, stick in the car, ready to go, right? So plug in electric vehicles. So there's three main ways we could power an electric car. We're really only concerned about two of them in this project, right? Because really two of them are portable for cars. And then last time, yeah. I was just going to say that the surge power is the uh, mathematical calculation of the amount of work produced divided by the amount of time it takes to produce that work. Yeah, that's what you did last time, right? We did, we did that little math experiment where you got outside on the electric carts. Did you notice some surge power from an electric cart? Even though you were kind of like going Mario Kart with those things. Yeah. Right? But they're, they're electric vehicles, right? Was that thing plugged into the wall anywhere? Yes. No. no. Right? Did it have fuel like gasoline or diesel in it? No. 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 Right? What did it have of those three that we talked about? In, what did it have? Rechargeable you said batteries. Yeah. rechargeable batteries, right? So we plugged it into the wall, we recharged it, and we were able to look at the surge power. And remember, those electric vehicles are going to beat every time, hands down, those combustion vehicles and surge power, right? You can get that instantaneous power when we want it. Um, so how do rechargeable batteries work? Well, what do we have to do to a rechargeable battery to make it work? We got to charge it, right? So how do we charge it? Plug, it in. plug it into the wall, right? So if you have a plug-in electric vehicle, we plug it into the wall. Once the batteries are full, we're good to go. And we talked about how many miles we could get out of a typical plug-in electric vehicle. Is it like 50 miles or is it like 250 miles? Yeah, it's like 250 miles, right? So it's very similar to a tank of gas, right? So the consumers like that, customers like that. All right, so now this is the new stuff for this project too. We, we talked about fuel cells in a different way from the last project. We're not using microorganisms anymore in our fuel cells. Nathan said we're using hydrogen, right? And we're making our own hydrogen. You made your own hydrogen in the first lab and you um, took water and you broke it apart. You guys remember doing that? You made some oxygen, you made some hydrogen, and we shoved all that hydrogen in a tank for you, right? That's like your gas tank on your car. That's the same thing you're going to be doing today. So you're, this is the tank of hydrogen. The difference is this is actually a pressurized tank of hydrogen now that you're going to be using today. So these little, they're called hydro sticks. We've already made the hydrogen for you, but we made it the exact same way that you made it in that first project. So I've got these little electrolyzer devices in there. We pour distilled water in them. We crank this thing into the front of it, and it fills this cylinder up with pressurized hydrogen for us. So the fuel cells that you're using today, they still need hydrogen, just like the other ones that you use to make our electricity. This is your hydrogen. Right? Already made for you, already ready to go, made from water, right? just like the way you made it. If you have an issue, call me over. I'll help you with it. Okay? If there's any technical difficulty in getting it set up, getting the VI open, getting the program running for you so that you can actually collect data. Because really, truly, starting with test two here, step four, um, we're going to switch it to manual mode. And now you and your team are going to determine the rest of the tests for today. And it's going to be totally up to you what you decide to, to test with this one, all right? That means you got to design a trial. 
We know we want to compare batteries to fuel cells, but we want to do the same thing in each of those tests, right, where the only difference is the power source. We want to take the same measurements in a notebook for that. You're going to do four different tests, so two, three, four, and five different tests where you compare fuel cells and batteries. Because what Xander said earlier is that you guys as a team have to present this later on at the end of the project, right? And you're going to have to propose either fuel cells or rechargeable batteries for a fleet of electric vehicles. And this type of data, the data that you're taking today, the data you've taken the other three days, that's what's going to help you determine what your proposal is going to be for Amazon, for the police department, for the fire department, whatever fleet of vehicles you guys decide to use for this project. Each of the projects in AC Clean Energy Technology has embedded academics in it that the students discover. It's all just-in-time learning. So when they need it in the project, they get that piece of math. When they need it in the project, they get that bit of environmental science. And then the students are able to start forming those connections to those core classes back at their home high school. You know, they're sitting in a biology class, and today in their clean energy project, we were talking about some aspect of biology. Um, that type of uh, real world uh, contextual learning is going to mean so much more to them in their classes back at their home high school. Just plug that power into that little port, make sure that one fits. Where is the direction? The directions right here. I think you got to start here. Add hydrogen. Are you going to set the, um, the MIDAC up and such? Yeah. We're testing like fuel cells versus like a battery, an actual battery pack. We're seeing which one does better as like when we're testing it. There's voltage, then there's speed, and like just overall how well does it do with the load. So there's like two different types of um, controls. There's manual and cruise control. For the manual control, you, you, you can obviously, just like, it's just like a car in manual control, you, you pick what you want to do. If you want to keep your foot on the gas, if you want to do this, but in cruise control, it's set to a point and see how it does with specific loads and we determine the data from the speed and the voltage compared to the fuel cells of the battery pack. Ah, oh, there it is. Now we got to run it. The deal is, we got to get measurements of when it goes uphill, almost going uphill or on flat surface and we got to see how many um, power the engine is getting to go up up that hill and we got the gauges right here and it's still on top of that the, the load that's the load it's, it's, still, right on flat. Right it's still, still on flat. flat so it's on zero now it's going up because the car's about to go up and it's up comparing to see um which like in this case which method of powering an electric vehicle would be the best mm. Um, so it's less competitive and more persuasion, pretending like it's an actual audience, but really it's just comparing our evidence to the other group. So you see how the car is uphill? Look, the engine power, the engine power is getting slower because it's going uphill. Now when you go back to the graph, go back over here to um, curves. See now look, the, um, the car is going down from the hill. It don't got no, that much load. You see how fast it gets? And whenever it gets low, the, um, the graph will start going up, up, like higher, then goes down, higher and goes down, because you got more load in it. You can also hear it get louder, the engine get louder and it, when and it get louder. louder. Now it's going back uphill and the engine power is decreasing. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. It looks like it's working. I can hear it humming. Yeah, but whenever it get, look, whenever it get a lot of load, like you're going up here, it, the engine, like you can hear it slowing down. Yeah, because again, so just think about that though. Like if you're driving your car, right, and it's in cruise control and there's this big hill coming up on the interstate, doesn't your car have to respond to that, right? Yeah. And they're like, oh my gosh, what just happened? Now I still gotta go 70, because right? Because you can get that look. Yeah. And the RPMs will go up, yeah. It's not going back uphill. Yeah, it's going back up. Oh, you can hear it almost stopped when it's going so vertically. Look, you see how it's going straight? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should pause it when it's at its fastest and for less load. Okay. I guess we'll wait till it has the highest load. So we don't just start in the middle. Right, hold up, give him one more time. Right there. It's wait for it, it's about to hit 100. It's gonna go down now, that's the highest. Okay, there's good. Alright, so you're 
So now the Lotus 100, the speed is about 110. like that then okay so we're going through like what's the power and stuff for the different inclines like that's one right so there. yeah all now right, we gotta look at speed to and all that right down for engineering you know, with the four different inclines it's yeah. flat and then it's basically 90 degrees and our speed is going to try to stay at 100 but it takes a second to adjust to get there is it 100 Yep. Voltage is 5.4. So that's for wall power. We got to do high battery pack. All these are going to be connected in series. Okay. And then flip your switch to middle. Peel that side up. I'm going to start to load at 100%. Then we'll go to 70 mm -hmm. with the manual power at 60%. The last one was on cruise control. Go back up to 60 this time. Uh, yeah, let's go back to 60. So, yeah, go back to 60. Look how slow it's going at about 100. It's actually going. Can't Barely, but it was. Hear. Now look at the speed. Even though the power is on 60, the speed still on 20. That's a slow. Okay, the voltage was really, really low this time, close to zero. Engine power, the same thing. Okay, so... You got everything already? Mm -hmm. We use the MIDAC system a lot because it, it allows us to get data that we aren't able to get. So, it, such as this, it reads like voltage, speed, how much load is being put on it. And so, it allows us to get more data and so when we're deciding between batteries and hydrogen, it gives us more, the view, more specifics of it. All right, from the data we got from the fuel cell compared to battery um, tests, from zero to 50 load, they're completely identical. But as the load gets higher from 75 to 100, the fuel cell is more reliable. It goes faster. And that'll, that'll be good for us near the end of the project so we can basically choose that this is the is better than battery so that technology seen at least from your data seems to outperform the batteries in in fleets of vehicles right mm -hmm. good good job today i'll see how change the what, is what was the first voltage for 100 load? Uh, for which one? The battery? No, the height. 1.1. 1. 1. 1. 1. Yeah, height 1.1. 1. 1. 1. Uh, we got okay, it. that was good. So each of these groups is in a different spot right now. Some of you guys have totally finished with data collection. Some of you are still in the middle of your data collection. And you're going to have more data that you're going to need to collect next time. That's okay. All right. Um, but Let's do this again. Raise your hand if you think that what we did today was challenging in some way, shape, or form. Okay? Because, good, I agree with you um, because I had to come around and help um, every group multiple times with something, with some aspect of this, right? There's a lot of different things, moving pieces and parts all at the same time that all have to work, all right? Because every single group, all five of the groups in the lab today, were able to experience success with this. Right? Which, that's extremely important. That's important for us that we give you the software and the technology and the tools and the curriculum so that you can be successful. But that's also a compliment to you guys because you were able to get through it. What I want to talk about, though, is what we found from some of the individual groups. You were using the MyDyno. You were comparing using fuel cells as a power source for your car. And you were comparing that to using rechargeable batteries as a power source for your car. So I'm going to ask Jackson's group to share. They made uh, bar graphs with their data. And again, just one of their tests, not all of their tests, um, share those results from that test with us, Jackson. Okay, for speed, we made a bar graph. And from 0 to 50 uh, load, it was completely identical. But from 75 to 100, 
the fuel cell uh, the fuel cell speed was slightly higher, which means it's more reliable. And then I just did the voltage bar graph, and from at zero the fuel cell voltage is higher, and then at 50 the battery voltage is higher, and it just keeps going back and forth. So they're kind of equal, I'd say. Okay. There, there's not much difference with the voltage, but for the speed, the fuel cell is more reliable. Great. So that's that is a valuable lesson, though, right? If you've got one set of data that's kind of inconclusive, that doesn't really tell you a whole lot about the differences in those two power sources, then we got to go to something else, right? We got to look at a different set of data. So you had one set of data that really gave you a conclusive difference where you could say, yeah, this technology is far superior than the other one, right? So that's good. That's what they figured out. Isaac, I saw you guys had some graphs. But your graphs were not bar graphs like theirs were. Yours were what kind of graphs? Line graphs. Line graphs. Okay. What did you guys figure out as a team from your line graphs? So from the line graphs, we could see that the as the load decreases, the voltage and the speed increase. And what we saw differences between um, with where the hydrogen cell and the battery pack, the hydrogen cell looked seemed to plateau out around 20 and zero load, but the battery pack seemed to keep um, increasing almost exponentially as the load decreased. So do you think you could use that information moving forward when you start to have to make some proposals for this technology? Um, yeah, we found out that uh, hydrogen fuel cells were, were more reliable at higher loads, but battery packs worked better at lower loads. And that's very similar to what you guys found, right, Jackson? Close. We actually said that um, they were pretty much equal at the lower loads, but fuel cell, I agree with him that yeah, it's so we, higher. We might be on to something, right? We might, now we've got two groups that had somewhat similar results with fuel cells. Xander, what did you guys figure out from your test that you did? Yeah, the hydrogen battery packs are very similar at speed on all load ranges. because. Well, we didn't do any graphs yet because right. we were just getting our right. tables done. Right. But so far, what we found was that like the loads are kind of similar when they're like some can be the same at the same time, uh, like even if they're different. But like the voltages keep like they go like in the middle for us. Like they went up, like definitely. Okay. But when it went too high or too low, it wasn't enough at all. Yeah. So maybe somewhere there in the middle ground, there's kind of like a sweet spot for this technology, yeah. right? Parker? I noticed something really weird with the the, ba the battery pack. I, mm -hmm. I changed out. I actually probably was the only one in here that changed out two different battery packs. And I noticed that uh, it is probably the only thing that keeps a very low voltage. But it still increases. But it, it, it just doesn't produce a high amount. So I think if you were initially start out with a higher voltage like going in there it would might it might actually work out better but I, I just wanted to state that that was yeah so how could we accomplish that though if, if you've figured out that there's a problem with a battery pack mm -hmm. and a battery packs not giving us the amount of voltage that we need well what could we do you can always change them out you can always all right so yeah you could maybe the they've started to lose some of their charge mm -hmm. just like with your laptop batteries the more you charge and discharge them right the battery life starts to not be as great as it used to be um, and then could we in theory get a bigger battery pack yes right so if we're sure. supposed to get you know three 1.5 volt batteries if we're supposed to get 4.5 volts like we're supposed to be and you see we're not getting 4.5 volts then that makes it hard to be able to compare the two yes right? So we could get a bigger battery pack, maybe use four batteries instead of three batteries. They make those. What's the cool part about using batteries, too, is you can always use a solar panel to charge them at home. Absolutely. And then you can just change them out. Then you have a second pair of batteries to continue your process of driving to work or wherever you go during the day. I just find that kind of cool, you know? Excellent. So does everybody kind of know what you need to do with this now moving forward? So you've got to finish these trials. That's the, the number one goal, because you've got to get all of this data so that you can start working up the data into these nice either um, line graphs, line charts, bar graphs, you know, <laughs> however you can, your group can analyze the data so that you can come up, start coming up with some conclusions. Working as a group 
and working as a team is like the best thing. If you're doing something wrong, that other person might know more about that, and so you just all work together instead. I think this class will help me in the future because it's teaching me lots of soft skills, so lots of teamwork skills and communication, and you wouldn't be able to make it through this class without talking to other people and learning how to work with a team, but also be a leader at the same time. Right now, there's a lot of talk about the environment, global warming and such. So this class, it opens everybody's eyes to that. Overall, just because of um, what we're doing and how it's different than other classes, this idea of what we're doing in here will help us, everyone in here, later on. So that would make new jobs for us. I think this class is very beneficial to me because um, it helps me show like what my strong suits are. A lot of the technology stuff, like <laughs> hooking up some of the um, components, I became like quite good at throughout this entire like experience and year. If I ever like want to change something like in my future for a career, like it just sparked that interest in me.